game of unlimited possibilities and championships are decided by the unexpected and that's what happens. Severe pain as he went down. He hurt his shoulder. One on one, I'm kind of surprised to see him hitting you. Yeah, I am too, and that last swing is an indicator of what we're talking about. Here's the 1-1 one, one pitch, and Weevil swings and drives this one. Down the right field line. If it's there, it's gone. It's gone! The Longhorns are going to the National Championship Series. Chance Wheelis down the line. A leadoff solo homer, and the Longhorns have won it. Omaha just provides uh, the greatest feelings in the world when you're on top, and um, it's, this is a great place to be. Isn't it special that when two teams are playing for the national championship, two out of all the entire, and it's national championship, yet we in the sport of baseball, in college baseball, refer to this special event as Omaha. Get your program! Programs! Radio Not Omaha, Nebraska! Omaha, Nebraska! Yeah, yeah. Omaha, Nebraska! Yeah. I've heard the atmosphere here is just simply electric. Second, the pitch, swing, deep drive, left field, going back to the wall, he leaps, it's gone! See a long run for Bogey, he dives and he makes the catch! Oh, baby, what a play! You can't imagine what it's like until you get here. Rounding third, Hook coming to the plate. Here comes the throw, not in time! And the Sun Devils have won it! You know, getting to Omaha and playing the College World Series is something that you know every kid growing up watching college baseball dreams about. That's why I came and played college baseball. I mean, that's every little kid's dream. Oh, my! Oh, it's the best atmosphere in the world. They say it's, uh, it's better than the World Series in Major League Baseball. I've been dreaming about this since I was you know, a little kid. The pinnacle of college baseball, I mean, this is, this is it. Feet spread wide apart. Here's the 2-2 to Barton. Breaking ball, swung and a miss, strike three! That's it! The Longhorns have won the national championship! The experts said the 2005 College World Series was anyone's ball game. And all eight teams left standing in Omaha believed that this year was the year for them. But it was last year's runner-up, the Texas Longhorns, which somehow managed to sneak into town and take over the College World Series like they owned it. And when the dust finally settled, it was apparent that indeed nobody messed with Texas. You know, what, what I said was, um, uh, it's, it's mandatory for us to be here, I think, and, and, and it is a relief. And it is. It is mandatory for us to be here. And uh, if we fall short of being here, we've fallen short of the first level of expectations. Stay high, that's a drop on. You two gave up, blows this horn. The Longhorns rolled off five straight wins in Omaha, including a sweep of the Florida Gators in the championship series. Hook'em horns echoed through Rosenblatt Stadium as the Longhorns and their legendary coach, Augie Garrido, were headed back to the 40 Acres with their sixth national title. Welcome to the 2005 College World Series. Welcome to Longhorn Lightning. Earning a trip to Omaha is every college baseball player's dream. And the road to Omaha and the College World Series is never easy. Rosenblatt Stadium has played host to this great tournament for the past 50 years. There's an energy that flows through the College World Series. It's electric. What folks around here have called the magic of Omaha. Jansen brings it home. Swing and a ground ball towards short. Charging symbol. He throws. And that's a Nebraska historic winner. After nearly a 100-game season, the eight teams who made it to Omaha have proven to themselves and the nation that they belong among the elite of college baseball. And now each team faces a double elimination tournament to decide the 2005 national champion. The Texas Longhorns were unseated entering the College World Series as they faced elimination several times on the road to Omaha including their biggest game of the tournament to date in the Super Regional against Ole Miss in Oxford. 
Another reason the underachieving Longhorns arrived in Omaha as an underdog was their winless record against Big 12 rival Baylor, which swept the four games this season versus UT. The Bears were almost eliminated in the Super Regional Final, but came back to win two straight against Clemson and earned their first trip to Omaha in 27 years. It's been almost twice as long since the Beavers from Oregon State earned a spot in Omaha. Their Super Regional victory against USC ended a 52-year World Series drought. And Tulane arrived in Omaha for just the second time in school history. The Green Wave also survived a pair of elimination games in their Super Regional Series win over Rice. The headliner on the other side of the bracket had to be the Nebraska Cornhuskers. Though there's never a lack of fan support at the College World Series, the Huskers' presence in Omaha added an extra layer of hometown excitement. Their Super Regional sweep of Miami earned them their third trip in five years. Could this be the year for the Big Red? <laughs> One of the most surprising teams in Omaha was the Florida Gators, who made a bold move up the baseball ladder in the Sunshine State in 2005 with a big Super Regional win against Florida State. Also representing the Southeast Conference were the Tennessee Volunteers, who earned their trip with two straight wins against Georgia Tech. Let's break on Glee. Go ahead, Todd. Go ahead, Todd. Glee. Oh, we got to get another one. Yellow line. Yellow line. Yellow line. It's never easy knocking out the defending champs, but Arizona State staged an amazing comeback and upset Cal State Fullerton, earning their first trip to the College World Series in seven years. Day one began with an all-SEC matinee matchup between Florida and Tennessee. For us to get to Omaha means that we've done everything that we set out to accomplish as a team. When we came out to Rosenblatt on the day before we, we the day we got here, it really it seemed like um, like hallowed grounds. Like you know you'd seen it on TV, but you never thought you'd be there. When I was 14, I came to Omaha and watched watched this World Series, and ever since then it's been my dream. Two balls, two strikes, more and ready. The pitch, swing and a miss, he struck him out. Oh my, Alan Horn, notorious for slow starts, has done something he's never done in Florida, and that's strike out the side of the first inning. Laporta sitting on 24 home runs, 73 RBI. Coach Haver, the wind, the pitch, fly ball, well hit to left. Is that number 25? There it goes. Or zip Florida in the fifth, hard-hitting Adam Davis looking for more, but Eli Orge leaps and steals a grand slam from Davis to keep the game within reach. Tennessee starts to make some noise in the seventh, down 6-2. The runner at second, here's the payoff pitch to Chase Headley. He rubs that ball in the air towards right. Let's see if it stays fair, and it does. And that's a home run. A home run for Headley, and Tennessee has made it a two-run game but Florida buckles down in the ninth. The 0-1 pitch, swung on a ground ball, diving stop by Gasky at 30, he'll flip to second, they got him! Oh my! All three, strike one. The pitch, swung on a ground ball to shortstop, Torty gloves it, on to Davis, and that's the ball game. They forced out Fitzgerald, and the Gators have won the first game here in Omaha. They've beaten the Tennessee Volunteers. Nebraska had the shortest trip on the road to Omaha, less than 60 miles from their home field in Lincoln. A sea of red waiting inside for the start of their opener against Arizona State. For me personally to get to Omaha, I mean, that's, that's the reason I came back for my senior year, and uh, that's why college baseball players play. Today at practice, I think, uh, you know, I think it really set in that, that how much hard work it, it's paid off and, and what, a, you know, what a privilege it is to, to be here and, and play in Omaha. Everything I've sacrificed and everything I've done to get here has been a big part of my life. You know, it's just another step, and, you know, we're not finished. We're not happy with getting here. We want to win a national championship. It's our hometown, pretty much, and it's just uh, we couldn't ask for anything more, and we're definitely excited to be here, and, you know, we're looking for a national championship, and we're going to go get it. And the Huskers wasted little time giving their fans something to cheer about. Nice swing and a ground ball bounced up the middle. Pass the second baseman. Simicitis is rounding third. He'll score. Gordon Dix for third. He's safe. Ledbetter, an RBI single. 
Husker starter Joba Chamberlain cruised through the first five innings, giving up only one run. The swing and a miss and a slider. He struck him out. But the Sun Devils were able to solve him in the sixth. Gozwich into right field, pretty deep. Mace with the gap. Gurch is there and it goes all the way to the wall. One run will score. Two runs are scoring. Here comes the third man, Curtis, all the way to the plate. The throw and he is out at the plate. Arizona State takes the lead. It's 3-2 Sun Devils. The Husker fans demanding the comeback in the bottom half of the sixth. Base is loaded for Ryan Worley. It's 3-2 Arizona State. The pitch. Line shot up the middle, base hit. One run score. Mohan is being waved around third. He'll score. Throw to second, safe. In the eighth inning, goes Witch again with a man in scoring position. But Husker closer Brett Jensen, as he's done all tournament long, gets the big strikeout to end the inning, and the home state Huskers go on to win the game. Jensen brings it home, swing and a ground ball towards short, charging symbol, he throws, and that's a Nebraska historic winner. the first College World Series victory in University of Nebraska history. Five to three in the opening game against the Sun Devils of Arizona State. The day two matinee matchup featured Oregon State and Tulane. Both teams arriving in Omaha with the best overall records in NCAA Division I baseball. The preparation to, to play here in Omaha, it's a little more intense. We are a competitive team. Uh, we have a lot of heart, and uh, we, we came here to win. I've heard about the atmosphere here during the series that, I mean, it's as close to a major league atmosphere as you can get. We know we're not done um, and have uh, business still to take care of here. In the top of the sixth, Owings dug himself a hole loading the bases on walks, but Brian Bogusevic bailed out his pitcher. Micah is working from the wind up here with the bases loaded. Here's the pitch. Liner in the right center field, long run for Bogey. He dives and he makes the catch! Oh, baby, what a play! You just saved three runs, folks. Saw it come off the bat. I thought there was, you know, a chance it could be caught. And then, you know, I'm just thankful that it, it was it was in the position that it was. Because if it was any more in the gap, you know, that's a, a it would have been a double. Bottom of the seventh, Mike Hamilton bunting. Owings on his way to second, trying to disrupt the double play. Makes contact on the slide with Darwin Barney. Coach Pat Casey leaps out of the dugout looking for interference, but doesn't get the call. You're taught when you slide to throw your hands up. Um, and I know that my, my hand did kind of nick him a little bit. I wasn't intentionally trying to grab him at all because I'm not that type of player. Later in the inning, two on and two outs now for pinch hitter Scott Madden. Here's the pitch. Swing and a fly ball into right field. All the way is the right fielder. Lays down and it's down for a hit. We're tied. In to score is Hamilton. Around third is Bogus Shevick. Not only are we tied, we lead it. Two late two. Oregon State one. Bottom of the eighth, Tulane adds another. Nathan Souther cranks one deep into the left field bleachers, and it's 3-1 Green Wave. That's all they need as Daniel Latham gets the save and Tulane gets the win. The nightcap matched Big 12 rivals Texas and Baylor. For me, this is my fourth College World Series in Omaha here and it's, it's something that nobody can ever take away and it's something that's really special. And I've been really blessed to be a part of four teams that have been able to reach Omaha. Worked hard all year, put in the hours, now it's our time. Atmosphere is electric, um, people going crazy. Uh, it's a good time for everybody. That's the last time the game's really pure. I mean, you're pulling for everybody out there, and uh, you know, the, the best thing you can do is win. You're not in it for yourself, you're in it for your teammates. I'm so happy to be here, and we're just gonna make the best of it. Top of the first, two one pitch, one on that, driven well. Way out, out toward left field, back with a chance, and you can say goodnight to it. A one out, two run homer into the left center field bleachers from Seth Johnston. With Seth leading off of that two-run home run really 
took a lot off of me as a pitcher and made me a little bit more comfortable going out there because I had a lead behind my back. Texas redshirt freshman Adrian Alaniz was outstanding. And the one ball, two strike pitch. Swing and a miss. He struck him out. Payoff to Ford. Breaking ball outside corner, strike three call. Two to one, Texas, top of the sixth. McCormick pitching to Robbie Hudson. Fastball chopped. It's going to be a tough play. McCormick has it. His throw to first. Gets wild. It's going to score one. Coming in to score is Kiner. Here comes T Garden rounding third. On the way to the plate. Here comes the throw. It's offline. And T Garden scores. The Longhorns gain a little separation from the Bears and let their defense do the rest. Breaking ball, chopped in the ground. Moreau diving to his left. What a play. Throw across the diamond. That you can hang a star on, folks, as good as it can be done. On comes the best closer in the nation, Jay Brent Cox, to finish it out. And the payoff pitch. Ground ball, hit to short. Johnston up with it. Set throw to first is there. And the Longhorns beat the Baylor Bears, and they move on in the College World Series. Texas with a 5-1 to one victory behind a splendid pitching performance from Adrian Alaniz. It's not just the players who dream of making it to Omaha. For many fans, it is the sporting destination of the year, every year. Brats, dogs, burgers. From the LSU fans who make the trip, Tigers or no Tigers, to the young road trippers with eight bucks for a ticket and no place to stay. And that's exactly the way they like it. Scones. My brother Slim, he's a little overweight. We drove here from Iowa. The spot, I mean, you take a look at this rope. This What's closer to the gate than this rope? We've been here for about 16 hours now. These guys are here. They're here early. They're going to get the spot they want. Front low, front row. We haven't had a motel in five years. This grass is our home every year. We're, we're going to be happy to show you our, our tent. Yeah, in the zoo parking right by lot the zoo by the sidewalk. The grass, we got a hammock up in the tree. If you don't, if you're not roughing it, you're not at the College World Series. Get up in the it's a palace. It's a palace and a half. This we is got, our home. For we the got five World people staying here. Up here, we got we got our nature boy. He's nature boy, we have hanging out. You could you could sit up there for days waiting for the for the greatest game on earth. These gator batters, and you'll catch home runs out here. High fly ball, that one left Rosenblatt Stadium. I didn't think this baseball was ever going to come down. Over here, you got you got these people in there, in their in their campers. I mean, for that, and look what they could have had. You know, we call this the BTC. <laughs> this is called the Big Time Cruiser. This is a 27-inch Sony flat screen with a couple of big speakers. And then we have a cook stove. We put our grill on top of it, that's a cook stove. This probably, uh, without being bodacious, is probably the premier tailgating vehicle. It has five TVs in the interior of the coach. I've had many people say, this is like a Corvette RV. As we're going down the road, we can watch movies. This is a flip down TV, 15 inch plasma. For seats three and four, it draws numerous crowds and you have to be willing to accept it or you just better go buy Grandma's one thing. I mean, you make the decision. And they're not first in line. Yeah, they were not first in line. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I hear you. Arizona State head coach Pat Murphy and his son enjoying Father's Day together at the College World Series, with the Sun Devils facing Tennessee in the first elimination game of the tournament. Freshman catcher J.P. Arancibia in the box against Eric Averill Aaron Sepia broke Todd Helton's record for most homers by a Tennessee freshman, and he hits one here, high and deep to left field, back to the track, and leaping is Curtis. He won't get it, and it's out of here for a home run for J.P. Aaron Sepia, his 14th of the year, and Tennessee has a one to nothing lead. Freshman James Adkins on the mound for the Vols in command. Travis Buck looking to help the Sun Devils break through against Adkins in the seventh. 1-0 pitch, swung on, lined into center field, and that'll drop for a base hit. Into score is Safara, and Travis Buck delivers with a clutch two-out RBI single that gets the Sun Devils on the board and whittles the Tennessee lead to 2-1 to one here in the seventh inning. Seth Donnan's at the plate with runners on second and third. He pounds one toward the left center gap. It drops for a double. 
Rocky Laguna scores, and the Sun Devils take their first lead, 3-2. Tennessee now with the tying run on. Bresnahan at the belt, the kick and the 3-2 pitch. Swing and a pop-up, foul, Larish gives chase, and he makes the catch, sliding into the tarpaulin off the first base side to retire the side in the eighth inning. Pat Bresnahan looking to close it out, pitching to Aaron Sebia. The 2-0 pitch, swing and a pop-up, foul off first. Larish has a play, shields his eyes from the sun, makes the catch, and the ball game is over as ASU rallies and beats the Vols 4-2 as the Sun Devils stay alive at the College World Series. Florida knew coming in that they'd have to deal with the Nebraska fans. What's the best way to quiet a raucous crowd? Get out early, and that's just what they did. The pitch swung on and a ground ball hit down the first base side. That's a fair ball down into the corner. Parcelletti around first, digging on his way for a second. And he'll stand up there with a double. On the very next pitch, Adam Davis. First pitch, a curveball swung on, hit pretty deep to right field, way back and back, and it is gone. Oh, my. Adam Davis has delivered. And the Gators lead two to nothing. Florida now up three to one in the third. And the pitch. There's a blooper toward the left field line. Dickey can't get to it. Plays on one hop, going to third. Here's the throw, the slide, and safe at third is Bohannon. Going to second on the play is Bruce. But the Gators strike for four more in the fifth. 1-0 pitch, swung on and slapped down the left side. That's a fair ball right on the chalk line, curving into the bullpen. Here comes Corsoletti to score. Laporta is being waved in, and he is coming to the plate. Here's the relay. He's safe. It's a two-run double right on the chalk line down the left field line for Geraldman, and the Gators now lead 7-2. to two. Nebraska able to push two more across in the fifth, but Darren O'Day shuts the Huskers down the rest of the way. The one-two pitch, strike three on the outside corner. He got a little help from his defense in the ninth. Here's the pitch, swung on, fly ball left. Dickey came in, now racing back, going back, reaching up. He made the catch! Oh, my! Gavin Dickey initially was fooled and then turned and raced to the warning track right in front of the wall to make the second catch of the inning. One-two pitch. Swung on, a pop-up, shallow left, Cordy out, Dickey in, Dickey calling for it, he's got it, and the Gators have beaten Nebraska here at Rosenblatt Stadium. It's no secret that baseball players are a superstitious breed. While the ubiquitous rally cap may be the most obvious example, most clubs take a more developed approach to superstitions. They have sacred traditions, many leaning towards the undeniably bizarre. But few take their superstitions as seriously as those crazy Cajuns from Tulane. Well, you know, we got guys from all over, but uh, I definitely think uh, there's a little bit of uh, the Louisiana Cajun influence in just about everything we do. As far as superstition goes, you know, I think it comes with the territory. You know, most baseball players have little things that they like to do to, to get them in their comfort zone, and we're no different. But uh, I think we definitely enjoy having these different little rituals and superstitions that uh, we take with us everywhere, and I think it, it gives us a little bit of um, a uniqueness to our team. Uh, every game, Coach gets uh, popcorn and Diet Coke before every game. He usually takes it right after BP. He'll come out in a few minutes, and as he does his radio show, he'll come out and eat his popcorn and drink. You want to kill an ant with a sledgehammer, which basically means uh, that you want to stay ruthless and not just be satisfied with the victory, but you want to really be able to put away teams. And we started tallying up our victories here on the other side, and it's something that's gone with us everywhere on the road this year, and uh, something that we can always look to to sort of remember one of our main team philosophies that we have. The rope kind of symbolizes um, the tug of war, and you know, it's us versus the other team, and we're just making sure that there's a constant reminder for all of us to be pulling on the same side of the rope so we have the best opportunity to win. Yeah, we know that we've pulled the rope all season to get us here, and that if we keep pulling the rope together, I think uh, we're going to be all right in the end. Oregon State and Baylor both facing elimination to start day four. Baylor starter Trey Taylor having some control problems in the second inning, walking the bases loaded. And then walking in a run as the Ducks stroll out to a two-run lead. Michael Griffin helps Baylor break through in the fourth. One run already in, Seth Fortenberry comes in to score and tie the game at two. 
Next time up, Baylor eyes the lead. And here's the 2-1 pitch. It's hit on the ground, past the third baseman in the left field. Breeze is being waved around. Here comes the throw. Breeze will be sliding in head first with the go-ahead run. It's an RBI single for Kevin Rousseau, and the Bears take a 3-2 lead. But Oregon State comes right back in the bottom of the fifth. 1-0 pitch is hit up the middle in the center field. That will easily score Jenkins from second base. Going to third is Gillespie. He's going to be stopped there. It's an RBI single for Shea McFeely, and the Beavers have retied the game at three. And that's how it would stay into the ninth. Gunderson ready, and the payoff pitch. Call strike three, fastball on the outside corner, and Kyle knew it, and the inning is over. Oregon State's turn. Gillespie against Jeff Mandel. And Mandel with the pitch. One-two pitch. Line right at Michael Griffin. He's got it. It's a one-two three ninth, and we've got bonus baseball. Runners at the corners. Two outs in the tenth. Gunderson ready. And the 0-1 to Pankers is fisted. Right side. Nobody's going to get it. It's in the right field. A base hit. Ford is home to score. Breeze is on his way to third. The throw is cut. It's an RBI single for Mike Pankridge and a 4-3 Baylor lead. Just a bleeder past the second baseman out in the right field, and Pankridge has scored to give the Bears a 4-3 lead. Last chance for Oregon State. McFeely at second base. Chris Campos at the plate, and Mandel pops him up. Shallow left field. Witt. 70, Breeze, it'll be 70, he makes the catch, the ball game is over, and the Bears have defeated the Oregon State Beavers by a final of 4-3, recording their historic first win at the College World Series. We've had a tremendous year, but this is where we go from telling them how good we are to showing them how good we are, right here, right now. Game eight, Texas and Tulane, both with one win already in the bank. The winner of this one grabs a huge edge in the race for a berth in the championship series. Star outfielder Brian Bogus Sevick on the mound this time for the green wave, and he had his struggles early. Bases loaded, one run already in. Taylor Teagarden at the plate. Swing and a line drive in the left. This is on a hop to Hamilton. One run's gonna score for sure. Emus with the cut, throws the plate. The tag is down and out. At the plate is Kraus. Two outs, two to nothing to Texas. Kyle McCulloch didn't need much help. McCulloch, a sophomore, set down seven green wave batters on strikes in seven shutout innings. Swing and a miss, strike three. Southern going fishing. And when Tulane did make contact, the Texas defense was there to back him up. Backhanded by Johnson, throw across his body, and he got him. That's a big lead play. Two runners on, bottom of the fifth for Maroul. Drilled fair inside third. Extra bases. One runner's in, Hamilton just getting to it. Another runner around third, that's T Garden. The throw is going to be late. Two run double for Texas. Four to nothing, Longhorn. Ninth inning, Jay Brent Cox, as always, in to close it out for Texas. Swing and a miss, he struck him out. Ball game over. And the Texas Longhorns are going to what is essentially the final four of college baseball. Coach Pat Murphy came out and looked like he was headed to the mound, but now he is involved in a fairly animated discussion. The ability to motivate. It's what separates coaches in all sports. While many people can explain the mechanics of the game, understanding how to maximize human potential, that's another story. It's an inexact science. And in a game like baseball, where the most inconsequential moment can have the most consequential impact on momentum, Knowing how to motivate your team is essential. And that's where Arizona State head coach Pat Murphy comes in. While coaching styles always vary, Murphy's can sometimes border on the bizarre. We play hard. We have to play hard because we stink. So it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to not play hard if you're, if you're not very good. Why don't you just play good from the first inning? You know what I mean? Instead of driving me crazy. I finally almost quit in about the seventh. And I was making, as I showed Eric, I was making the 06 lineup up. You can see right here, it says 06. 
I got Zinna in relief, Martinez kid we got coming in, Bordas maybe at the end, Perez and Brez maybe in the middle, because that's a fifth and sixth innings important. They don't respect me at all, that's the thing. <laughs> we struggle with that all year. These type of games, uh, Murph usually shuts up about seventh inning. And uh, like he said, you know, that's when, that's when we get going. <laughs> Defensively, we're struggling a little bit. Step to the left, step to the right. We're not going to catch it. Yesterday, we were flatline froggy. So, today we're a musical. It's really inspirational. <laughs> <laughs> flatline froggy, think about it. Just think for a minute. Got it? No. Musical. I mean, what is music all about? What else do I say to you guys right before we go on the field? <laughs> All right, that we can say on TV. It's got to kind of flow. You don't force it. it just spews from you. It's very creative. See where I'm going with this? He'll do whatever it takes to keep the Sun Devils loose as they prepare for yet another stress-filled elimination game, this time against Nebraska and 20,000 Big Red Faithful. Like a comet burning bright. Everybody's dancing to the jail hell's rock. Spider Murphy on the saxophone and little Joe blowing on the slide trombone. I can't sing. <laughs> sing it, baby. As game time approaches on day five of the College World Series, the Sun Devils take their final cuts. Coach Murphy has other things on his mind. Am I as big as this guy right here? Huh? That's big. I didn't realize how fat I was. Fat. I didn't realize I was such a fat bastard. I just saw a picture of myself, and I am really concerned, guys. I'm going down to 205. That's a commitment. OK, boys, let's uh, reconnoiter re uh, our focus here. Talking about flatline froggy. Stay with it, boys. This is, this is uh, something you're very capable of. Don't believe for one second you're not capable. The atmosphere, fun, enjoy it, love it, soak it in. It don't have anything to do with that white ball coming at you. Want it hit to you, hit it on the fat part, make a pitch. In any order you want, that's what has to happen, okay? Flatline froggy the whole game, real. Flatline froggy the whole game, real, let's go. Fluids. Fluids. Get rid of fluids? Get rid of fluids? Is that bodily fluids? What is that? A sellout crowd dressed in red on hand for this one, hoping to see Nebraska add to their school record of 57 wins. Could be the last game. Play Both teams unaware they're about to take part in an all-time College World Series Classic. At practice one day earlier, it appeared Coach Murphy had a funny feeling about this game. Score a couple runs early. Larish lead off the game with a bomb or something. First inning, Jeff Larish leading off. Here's the 3-2. Swing and a deep shot left field. Going back, Boyer, to the track, to the wall. It's gone. It's the 21st home run of the year, 64 driven in, and the Sun Devils lead on Kroenke, 1-0. Third inning, it's Larish. Uh-oh, long drive, deep right, Gert's back. My goodness, he's hit another home run. Sun Devils now with a two-run lead. Not for long, next Nebraska at bat. Bases loaded with a run already in. Ryan Worley at the plate. Suicide, butted down the first base line. He gets it down, and the game is tied. Worley is tagged out, but Worley gets the ball down, and Gertz comes flying home from third on a suicide squeeze. Still in the fourth. Christie line drive up the middle, off the club of hoof. It goes to the center field. And the Huskers have battled back to lead it three to two. Here's the one two. Strike three call, a fastball down Broadway. Here's the three two. Strike three call on the outside corner. To the seventh we go, tied at three. Foul off first base, Ledbetter will have a play on it. He's under it, but gives way to the second baseman, Worley, who doesn't catch the ball. Well, those are the kind of plays that decide ball games. A second life for Curtis, and uh, 
boy, if he delivers now, the Huskers will be looking back at that one uh, big time. Curtis gets another chance, and surprise, surprise, the very next pitch. Jensen's pitch, swung on, grounded up the middle, and into center field for a base hit. Larish scores, taking third is Travis Buck, and Colin Curtis has delivered again, and now the ball gets away. Buck will score on the relay, and it's 5-3 to three as the Huskers' defense has collapsed here in the seventh inning. The Nebraska bench is stunned. Top of the ninth, the Go Big Red chant echoing throughout Rosenblatt. National Player of the Year, Alex Gordon up with two on against Sun Devils closer, Pat Bresnahan. The pitch, swing and a ground ball, off of the shortstop, Boyer rounds third, he'll score. Simicardis hangs at second, Gordon delivers. And that set up Andy Gurch. Two on, one out, and Nebraska trails no more. Sack in the pitch. Swing, deep drive, left field, going back to the wall. He leaps, it's gone! the ball over the wall in left field. Bresnahan is livid, and the Nebraska faithful can tell that victory is near. But Arizona State won't go quietly. First and third, nobody out for Joe Persakina. 3-2 pitch, swung on, and that's a blooper into shallow center field. Bruce comes on, and he makes the catch. Tagging at third, Donham scores the throw back to first. Out at first is Zafera on the double play. Sun Devils pull within a run, but instead of one out and a man on first for Jeff Larish, it's two out, nobody on. Seven to six, Huskers. Larish has homered twice, walked twice. Jensen's first pitch, swung on. There's a drive to center field. Bruce back to the wall, leaps. It's gone! Larish has homered to tie the game and become only the third player in college World Series history to hit three homers in one game. Take that, Huskers! This is unbelievable. Two outs, top of the 11. Zekri Zinicola facing Andy Gertz, and he gets him swinging to end the inning. Joey Hoop leading off the bottom half for ASU against Tony Watson, and Hoop lines one into left for a base hit. J.J. Safera steps in with Hoop, the winning run at second and one out. 1-0 pitch, swung on, and this looped into shallow right field. That'll drop for a base hit. Rounding third, Hook coming to the plate. Here comes the throw, not in time! And the Sun Devils have won it! And they eliminate the Nebraska Cornhuskers and move on in the College World Series. And while the freshman J.J. Safera came through with the game winner, it will be the sophomore Jeff Larish's three home runs that the Nebraska fans will never forget. Feels great, man. Unbelievable. No one, no one thought we could be here. No We're here. Let's go. We're going to win it all. We're going to win it all. Larry comes over. Everybody on their knees in the bottom. Seriously, seriously. Everybody on their knees in the I mean, this is why college baseball players play. Uh, it's, it's a huge reason why I came back for my senior year, uh, and it's so exciting. What a, what a fun time. Great feeling. You know, um, guys are guys battled, you know, and they never quit. And there was plenty of time to quit and plenty of time to not believe. And uh, when you get down in the ninth with a home crowd of 20-some thousand, you know, all cheering against you, and to come back the way they did is pretty special. We're really elated right now, but we got to get back down to that, you know, flat line. We can be a little froggy, but flat line froggy, you know what I'm saying? And uh, we get to that, and we'll, you know. As Larish leaves the park after the game, celebrating with fans and family, one fan returns his third home run ball. All he wants is a picture. Larish, the last man on the team bus after a hard day's work, 
gets one more round of applause from his Sun Devil teammates. Believe it or not, game 10 between Baylor and Tulane was almost as good. Both teams with a win and loss, both teams facing elimination. The green wave begins to build an early lead. One run already in. Mark Hamilton, a big cut. Playing in a long fly ball to right field. Get up, this is going a home run for Hamilton. On the hill for Tulane, J.R. Crowell was rolling along. Six shutout innings to start the game. Bogusevic up in the fifth with a man on. He slaps one into the left field corner. Scott Madden comes in to score and Tulane extends the lead to seven. Bottom of the seventh now, the Bears begin to stir. Senior Michael Griffin bounces one inside the bag at third. Kevin Savigny scores. Baylor gets three in the inning, trimming the Tulane lead down to four. Bottom of the eighth, Baylor fans looking for another big hit from Griffin. And the senior delivers again. It is granted on the left side, and it is through for a base hit. Fort Bear will score. Went around third. He's going to score. And it's a 7-5 ball game on a two-out, two-run single by Michael Griffin. Bottom of the ninth now, Reed Breeze looking to keep the rally rolling for Baylor. And Breeze comes Here's through. Here's the payoff to Breeze. It is granted through the left side. Base hit. Mandel will stop at second, Breeze at first, and the winning run is coming to the plate for the Baylor Bears and Zach Dillon. He shows bunt. Here comes the pitch. Dillon grounds it over the first baseman's head into right field. One run will score. It's a 7-6 ball game. Stopping at third is Gertis. In the second is Zach Dillon with a double, and it's a 7-6 ball game. One out now, bases loaded. Baylor still down by one. Tulane looking for the double play. Third baseman even with the bag at third. First baseman's even with the bag at first. Gomes ready. First pitch to Paul Witt. It's grounded back up the middle. Grabbed by the second baseman. He'll step on the back for one. Relay first to throw. Not in time. One run will score. Dylan's coming home, and the Bears win! The Bears win! The Dylan comes home with the game winner. He gets mobbed by his Baylor teammates at home plate as the Bears complete an improbable comeback, scoring eight runs in the final three innings to eliminate Tulane's green wave, eight to seven. It's a time-honored tradition unique to the game of baseball, passed on from generation to generation. A hobby for many diehard baseball fans, keeping score is a lifelong passion for Rosenblatt official scorer, Lou Spry. I'm Lou Spry. I'm the official scorer for the College World Series and have been in the last 25 years. Official scorers are the custodians of two of the game's most important assets, and that's its statistics and its records. And they still haven't scored it yet, but I would assume they're going to hang an air on Gordon. I believe they gave him a hit. My little brother played baseball, and so growing up, I was always the scorekeeper for his teams. So it just kind of is habit. Now that I have a son, I'm back into it. He played this year first time, so it's just kind of all coming back. And I think what the fans interested in is when the uh, the star player comes up in the eighth inning with the tying or winning runs on base, then we'll look down and see what he's done. And I like to look back on the history, right? We just like to see what the, what the other player did. Yeah. I really enjoy it, and uh, I don't know how much longer I can do it. I hope I figure that out and, and resign before they have to throw me out this window. As day six began, only four of the eight teams remained. Florida and Texas entered the day still undefeated and in need of only one win to advance. While Arizona State and Baylor were both in need of two straight victories to continue on to the best of three championship series. The Sun Devils looking to stave off elimination for a fifth time in the 2005 NCAA tournament. Here's the pitch, swung on, and a fly ball hit deep to right field, way back. A home run in the first by Travis Buck didn't hurt the cause as Arizona State took the early lead. Eric Averill off just two days rest on the mound for ASU, looking good here in the fourth inning. Bottom of six now. Now Colin Curtis has a chance to get a big insurance run home as he's up there with a man at third, one out. 
Collin one for one, an infield hit and a walk as he bounces a base hit to right field. That will score Laris to make it three to one, and Colin Curtis continues to deliver in the clutch. Averill, meanwhile, just got stronger as the game progressed. Now Averill's 2-2 pitch is swung on and missed for strike three. Another 1-2-3 inning for Eric Averill as he strikes out the final two hitters. Two gone in the ninth, and Eric Averill on his 113th pitch gets the grounder to short, and Arizona State fends off elimination again. First, the ball game is over, and the amazing Arizona State Sun Devils live to play another day. Forcing Florida into a one-game playoff for a chance to play in the championship series. Texas and Baylor meeting up for the sixth time this season in the nightcap. The Longhorns just one win away from the championship series. Texas half of the third. Nick Peoples slices one to right. Marul scores, and Texas again takes the early lead. But it wouldn't last long. Josh Ford all over the lazy curve from Ken Kasperic. He hits the first pitch high and deep toward left field. It's looking up. It's treetop tall and over the wall. It's a solo home run for Josh Ford to start the fourth inning, and we're tied once again at one apiece. Fifth inning now, Taylor T. Garden's turn for Texas. It's a fastball. It's hit toward the gap in right center field and deep. It is over the wall. A solo home run for Taylor T. Garden. And the Longhorns recapture the lead at 2-1. to one. A scary moment for Texas in the sixth. Sophomore first baseman Chance Wheelis at the plate. Swings, the bat flies from his hands. He falls to the ground in pain. He gets up holding his right shoulder. It's his right arm, and he can't even run. And they tag him out at first base. He can't get out of the box. He was in severe pain as he went down. But Wheelis would stay in the game. A strange play with Baylor threatening in the seventh. I think Fortbury showing bunt, and he does bunt it. He bunts it right back to Casperic, but his only play is the first, and he gets past the first baseman. Wheelis down the line. Russo around second to third. He's being waved home. Up with it. Here comes the throw. Not in time. Going all the way to third is Fortenberry. Watch the replay. Blinded by the setting sun, Wheelis never saw the ball leave Kasperic's hand. The Texas bench is stunned, and the game is tied. Still in the seventh, Buck Cody in relief of Kasperic. Fortenberry at third with one out. Cody ready. And the one, two, to seven. It's grounded through on the left side. Base hit. Home to score is Fortenberry. The Bears have a 3-2 lead on an RBI single by Kevin Seventy. A pitch hit RBI. Bottom of eight, Texas still trails. Peoples at third. Drew Stubbs, a fly ball toward Fortenberry and right. In a shallow right. Now Peoples will tag at third. Fortenberry will make the catch. Here we go, folks. Play at the plate. Throw coming in. Peoples slides. He's safe. And he collides and goes in. He is safe, and the ball game is tied at three. And there's going to be all kinds of argument because there was a collision at the plate. But Peoples has scored, and the game is tied at three. Bottom of the ninth, still tied at three. The injured Chance Wheeler stepped into the box, and the rest is history. It's a pretty heroic moment, and, and the story goes like this. I said, we're going to hit Van Hook for you to lead off the inning. And he said, looking me right in the eye, I hit this guy really hard. And I said, well, what about your shoulder? And he says, it's not going to matter. This kid just told me he wants to be a hero. I want to see what's going to happen here. He's staying in the game. Get a base runner any way you can. Don't be surprised to see Wheelis drop a bunt here. Here's the 1-1 one -one pitch, and Wheeler swings and drives this one. Down the right field line. If it's fair, it's gone. It's gone! The Longhorns are going to the National Championship Series. Chance Wheelis down the line. A leadoff solo homer, and the Longhorns have won it. Which team would advance to play Texas in the championship series? The Arizona State Sun Devils or Florida Gators? Coach Murphy looking relaxed as Jeff Larish stepped in to lead off the first against Alan Horn. And Larish wasted little time getting this one started. He ropes a double into the right field gap. And the Sun Devils are in business to start the game. 
Next up, Travis Buck. Horns pitch, swung on, and that's drilled to the gap in left center field. That'll get all the way to the wall, and we'll get the Devils on the board early. Larish rounds third. He will score. Buck is in at second with a stand-up double, and it's one to nothing, Arizona State. Second inning, two outs. It's Larish again. The pitch from Horn, change up, and that's ripped to right field, a base hit, and indeed, Joey Hook will score. And Arizona State suddenly rolling with a 3 0 advantage. And then something strange happened in the fourth. Actually, two strange events. As Alan Horn delivers to the plate, he collapses, suffering a hamstring pull as he plants his left leg. Alan Horn is on the ground, face down in the grass, just to the third base side of the pitcher's mound. Eags, you hate to put it in these terms or in this perspective, but uh, certainly from a Sun Devil standpoint, you, you kind of have to hope that the injury to Alan Horn does not uh, provide some sort of rallying cry for the Gators here. Then in the bottom of the inning, Brandon MacArthur pops up behind home plate. And a fan in the front row reaches over the rail. Goswich can't come up with the ball. Now the umpire is going to call him out. Plate umpire Bill Davis is going to call an out, saying that a fan reached over the front row of the seats next to the Sun Devil dugout, and it looked like a fan in a gold-colored ASU shirt. And Coach Pat McMahon is out and furious with the umpire Bill Davis protesting this call. And after the home plate umpire called a meeting to discuss the call, the coach let all the umps have a piece of his mind. Somehow, he avoided ejection. While the replay was inconclusive, the response from McMahon's Gators was decisive. The next batter was Brian LeClerc. And the pitch. There's a drive to right. Go ball, go. Get out of here. Gone. There we go. And just like that, the Sun Devils lead is cut to one at three to two. Florida with a pair of runners to start the fifth. Brett Bordas pitching to Adam Davis. The pitch swung on. There's a drive. Hit deep to left field. It's going. It's going. It is gone. Oh, my. Adam Davis has delivered. A three-run home run for Davis and a 5-3 lead for Florida. The next batter, the nation's leading home run hitter. Laporta swings. Hits a high fly ball down the left field line. It is way back. And it is a towering shot by Laporta, and the Gators get back-to-back -back round trippers, and they lead it now six to three. Sixth inning, Arizona State looking to mount yet another rally, but Florida gets the 6-4-3 double play to end the inning. To the ninth, Arizona State still down three, though you wouldn't know it to look at them. Tommy Boss working on five plus innings of shutout relief of injured starter Alan Horn. Joey Hoop singles, and that brings the tying run to the plate for Arizona State. Can the Sun Devils do it again? Tying run at the plate with two gone in the ninth for Arizona State. Breaking ball up the middle. This should do it. The flip to second, and the Gators, for the first time in the history of Florida baseball, will play for a national championship on Saturday. It's Florida and Texas in the championship series starting Saturday night. The energy began to build as Texas fans began arriving by the busload, all in anticipation of a sixth Longhorn NCAA title. There's a lot of Texas fans here. I like to call it home. To win a national championship for Texas, it means everything to us, for the team, for the school, for the state of Texas. What it means is um, uh, they are fulfilling their destiny and fulfilling their lives and fulfilling their dreams. It's just really special, and we get to do it one more time you know, for the national championship. The first part of the Omaha Arena is two 14 tournaments here. And then the second part becomes uh, a two out of three. You know, we're, we're really excited about how we respond to that. Well, for us to bring home a title is essential. Now that we're here, uh, we've kind of made it our, our home field for this week. Nobody can ever take this away from us. And, you know, I just think it's, it, you know, it's something I'll never forget. To come to Omaha and stand on top of that mountain would be, again, indescribable. You know, we put ourselves in position, you know, it's, you know, this is what it's all about. While they faced elimination several times during regional play, Texas couldn't have come to the championship series in better shape. Starters Adrian Alaniz and Kyle McCulloch were not only rested, but spectacular in their previous World Series outings. 
Florida, however, with their top three starters all unavailable for game one, needed someone to step up. That someone turned out to be freshman Stephen Locke, who last appeared exactly one month ago. Injuries play a factor here, and so does uh, going through the loser's bracket. And uh, we had the advantage coming into the, the championship series. But we had the advantage against Fullerton last year, too, and we lost. It's been nice to have, you know, all our aces been able to go one, two, three, like a, like a Friday, Saturday, Sunday game, but it just didn't work out that way, and that was the, you know, luck of the draw. You can't do nothing about it. you got to still go out there and play as hard as you can and look for a W. Texas coach Augie Garrido chose to make the Longhorns the visitors for game one. And they wasted no time putting the pressure on the freshman Florida starter. What a no. Check of the runner and the pitch. Line drive center field right at the center fielder. Going back over his head. Heading for the wall. Crouch rounding first. Heading for second. He'll have a stand up double. Nick Peoples scores the game's opening run as Texas takes the early lead. Texas proving once again they know how to play while ahead. Seth Johnston takes it himself. And on to first for the double play. Second inning, Gavin Dickey, a bounce to David Marule, touches third, fires across the diamond for the easy two. Third inning, Will Crouch up again, already with nine hits in the series, and there's his tenth. Toward left field, and you can say goodnight to this one. That one out of the ballpark. Will Crouch with a home run gives the Longhorns a two to nothing lead. Marule shining so many times with his glove, getting it done at the plate in the fourth. High and deep, it's got a chance, folks. Going back to the wall, is Dickey looking up, it's gone. Brian LeClerc looking for some way to break through against Alanis in the seventh. It comes up empty. Alanis finally exits in the eighth with a couple of runners on. In comes Jay Brent Cox looking for his 18th save. Love it. Uh, it's the funnest part of the game, so not everything interesting happens. 1-1 one, one pitch. Swung out, a ground ball, back up the middle. That's a base hit out of the center field. Tordy scores, Barton scores. Laporta drives in two, and the Gators are trailing just four to two. I walked a couple guys. I was, no excuse, I just walked them, and uh, I just knew I wanted the outs, you know, any way I could, and luckily I struck the guy out, bases loaded, and uh, gave us a chance to win the ball game. Bases loaded, two out. 2-2 two -two pitch, swing and a miss on a curveball. He struck him out. He struggled in that one inning, got us out of there, and then uh, the next inning came in and was lights out. Ninth inning, yeah, went well. Uh, I wasn't going out there looking to do that. Go to pitch, swing and a miss, got him to chase the breaking ball. Here's the 2-2 two -two pitch, swing and a miss. One ball, two strikes, two outs, the wind up from Cox, the one-two pitch, pull strike three, ball game over. How about Jay Brent Cox, six strikeouts. He gets the save, and the Longhorns take the lead in the National Championship Series. Obviously, they got two runs off of it, but you know that's why we got our man Jay Brent Cox in the bullpen. You know, to get us out of situations like that, he did the job again today. Texas tailgaters chopping up a little gator meat before the game might be just a bit premature. Florida coming in with a bit more confidence in game two with Brian Ball on the mound, even with only three days rest. For Texas, 11-4 sophomore Kyle McCulloch showing a variety of pitches early on. Now McCulloch, the 2-2 to Davis. Swing and a miss, strike three. To get down to it is just another game, and that way you keep everything, uh, all the other stuff out of it, and just go out there and pitch. Now the 3-2 to Dickey. Fastball swing at a strike three. He blew it by him. Bottom of the second for Texas, and David Marul comes through again. Yohan delivery. Swung on a ground ball, left side. That's a base hit. Passed by Parker in the left. Wheeler scores. Texas leads. One to left. Marul to the plate again in the Texas fourth. 1-1 pitch coming. Fastball, this ball crushed right at Dickey. 
He jumps, misplays it, it's off his glove. Rounding second, on the way to the plate is Teagard, and he's gonna score, and the Longhorns are gonna take a two to nothing lead. McCulloch still cruising along. We've got two outs and a pitch. Swing and a miss, number seven for McCulloch, and that's gonna retire the side. After his dramatic walk-off home run against Baylor, no surprise that Chance Wheelis makes his presence felt in the championship series as well. Chance, folks, going back and looking up, it's gone. Solo home run for Chance Wheelis, 3-0 Texas. Two runners on, still in the sixth, Marul up again, and he delivers again. Swung on, fly ball, hit deep, left center field, way back, and back, and it is gone. David Marul came to Omaha with a 229 batting average. It's his second home run in as many days. Texas up 6-0. I just got a hold of him and just kind of went out, so that's all I can say. But Florida would not fold. Brian LeClerc with a man on in the seventh. The stretch and the 1-0 pitch. Fly ball hit well to left. Go ball go. It is deep in the gap in left center. It is out of here. It is now Texas 6, Florida 2. Randy Boone relieves McCulloch, trying to get the Longhorns out of the seventh. He gets Corsoletti to pop up on the right side. Wheelis puts it away. Texas still holding a four-run lead. Now it's time for Jay Brent Cox. Two outs, two on for LeClerc. Now the one-two pitch. Curve ball hit back up the middle to Johnson and short. He'll step on second and force out Geronimo to retire the side. He's good at what he does, and he has total confidence in himself no matter what happens. Texas now just three outs from the national title. Swung on ground ball, hit the third in the roll. His throw to second for one. Relay to first in time. Five, four, three, double play. Texas now needs one more out. The players ready to explode out of the dugout. Cox 2-2 two, two pitch, swing and a miss! He struck it out for the sixth time in school history. You can light the tower orange. The Texas Longhorns have won the school's sixth national championship. The dog pile is happening at the pitcher's mound. It's the moment they said they would wait for. They would not dog pile until they won the national title. Yeah, I knew if uh, we wanted, I wanted to be on the mound, and uh, you know, it's a great feeling. Like I said, it's a dream come true for me and for everybody else. How about the fact that uh, our defensive player at third base becomes the offensive star of the tournament? That's the unexpected I'm talking about. It's pretty exciting, of course, but I don't know. I'm just surprised it all hit me right now, but I'm just excited that we ended up winning the whole thing. That's what we came here to do, and the MVP is just kind of. Tops it even more, I guess, but I'm just so happy that we won. And to these guys uh, next to me, uh, these are our seniors. It's their signature year. What a great signature. Thanks, guys. I love you. Thank you. One to one attends at the end of a very emotional game uh, in playing for the national championship to dwell so much on that game. And we do. It really was a great year. Just it hurts to lose at that. You know, at the end of the road, it was either we were either going to win or lose. And we, you know, we lost today. You might not get put in an opportunity, but once, and once you get it, you got to capitalize, and you can't, because you don't want to be looking back like I'm, you know, saying, I wish I would, you know, you wish you would have just done it, taken care of it. I, I had a blast. I mean, even playing today, I had a, I had a blast. You know, it's just something that, if you never get to relive it again, it was just, it's amazing, you know, something you can always take back and tell people. It's something that nothing, nobody can ever take away from you, getting to be out there and play. We just feel bad for our seniors and stuff. You know, a lot of guys made decisions to come back this year just to, you know, for one run at it, and, you know, we took our best shot. It, there's no letting anyone down because we are not in position today to play for that without all of their work, without everybody on the entire ball club's hard work and the way they believe. When you talk about a team, what I'm so proud of, that's what they are. And they really believe in each other. And the word love comes to my mind. I think next year, that now that we got a taste of what this is like, we're gonna, I think we're gonna push ourselves even harder to get back here and to 
get to the championship game and win it this time. They've raised the bar at the University of Florida in so many ways, and they're a very special group, and I'm very proud of them. Congratulations to them. They won. They played a heck of a game, but I won it next year, and I want to win. It's the true definition of a team championship right here is this 2005 Texas baseball team. This gear I'm wearing feels great, and everything is just uh, amazing, you know. The, it, it really fits. It's a magical place where if you're going to be the national champion, this is going to change their lives. Something we worked for all year and on an individual basis, uh, you know, all our lives individually, and uh, it all came together for us. We had our struggles, and now we're on top. You can't put a price tag on what happened today and yesterday. It's something that I'm going to remember for the rest of my life and tell my kids about. Augie, do you did. Do the comparisons to Texas of, you know, being the Yankees of college baseball, do you like that comparison? Do you find it ridiculous, or do you find it ridiculous? It doesn't matter what I like. <laughs> it's going to be done anyway, I and, mean, you know, I, you know, I can't care about that. If I start caring about things like that, then I can't stay focused on the bunt. Now there's something that's important. Uh, huh? Are you the Yankees? No. They're not playing very well. We are. <laughs> With so many appearances at the College World Series, Longhorn fans have taken to calling Rosenblatt Stadium the University of Texas at Omaha. But this year, a team that finished third in the Big 12, third in its conference tournament, finished first when it mattered most. Coach Garrido said from day one, it's mandatory for the Longhorns to make it to Omaha every year. They arrived unseated, yet from day one looked and played as if they were the team to beat. At times, they made it look easy, barely breaking a sweat in the Omaha heat and riding the perfect wave of stellar starting pitching, flawless defense, and one magical home run to a sixth College World Series title. Congratulations to the mighty Longhorns from Texas, the 2005 NCAA Division I National Baseball Champion. It's not just the players who dream of making it to Omaha. For many fans, it is the sporting destination of the year, every year. Brats, dogs, burgers. From the LSU fans who make the trip, Tigers or no Tigers, to the young road trippers with eight bucks for a ticket and no place to stay. And that's exactly the way they like it. Scoltons, my brother Slim, he's a little overweight. We drove here from Iowa. The spot, I mean, you take a look at this rope. This What's closer to the gate than this rope? We've been here for about 16 hours now. These guys are here, they're here early. They're gonna get the spot they want. Front low, front row. We haven't had a motel in five years. This grass is our home every year. We're, we're gonna be happy to show you our, our tent. Yeah, in the zoo parking right by the zoo lot, by the sidewalk. The we got a hammock up in the tree. If you don't, if you're not roughing it, you're not at the College World Series. Get up in the it's a palace. It's a palace and a half. This we is got, our home. For we the got five people staying here. Up here, we got we got our nature boy. He's nature boy, we have hanging out. Game. You could you could sit up there for days waiting for the for the greatest game on earth. These gator batters, and you'll catch home runs out here. I fly ball. That one left Rosenblatt Stadium. I didn't think this baseball was ever going to come down. Over here, you got you got these people in there in their in their campers. I mean, for that and look what they could have had. We call this the BTC. This is called the Big Time Cruiser. This is a 27-inch Sony flat screen with a couple of big speakers, and then we have a cook stove. We put our grill on top of it. That's a cook stove. This probably, uh, without being bodacious, is probably the premier tailgating vehicle. It has five TVs in the interior of the coach. 
I've had many people say this is like a Corvette RV. As we're going down the road, we can watch movies. This is a flip-down TV, 15-inch plasma. For seats three and four, it draws numerous crowds, and you have to be willing to accept it, or you just better go buy Grandma's Winnipeg. I mean, you make the decision. And they're not first in line. Yeah, they were not first in line. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I hear you. It's no secret that baseball players are a superstitious breed. While the ubiquitous rally cap may be the most obvious example, most clubs take a more developed approach to superstitions. They have sacred traditions, many leaning towards the undeniably bizarre. But few take their superstitions as seriously as those crazy Cajuns from Tulane. Well, you know, we got guys from all over, but uh, I definitely think uh, there's a little bit of uh, the Louisiana Cajun influence in just about everything we do. As far as superstition goes, you know, I think it comes with the territory. You know, most baseball players have little things that they like to do to, to get them in their comfort zone, and we're no different. But uh, I think we definitely enjoy having these different little rituals and superstitions that uh, we take with us everywhere, and I think it, it gives us a little bit of um, a uniqueness to our team. Uh, every game, Coach gets uh, popcorn and Diet Coke before every game. He usually takes it right after BP. He'll come out in a few minutes, and as he does his radio show, he'll come out and eat his popcorn and drink. You want to kill an ant with a sledgehammer, which basically means uh, that you want to stay ruthless and not just be satisfied with the victory, but you want to really be able to put away teams. And we started tallying up our victories here on the other side, and it's something that's gone with us everywhere on the road this year, and uh, something that we can always look to to sort of remember one of our main team philosophies that we have. The rope kind of symbolizes um, at home the tug of war, and you know, to us first the other team, and we're just making sure that there's a constant reminder for all of us to be pulling on the same side of the rope so we have the best opportunity to win. Yeah, we know that we've pulled the rope all season to get us here, and that if we keep pulling the rope together, I think uh, we're going to be all right in the end. Coach Pat Murphy came out and looked like he was headed to the mound, but now he is involved in a fairly animated discussion. The ability to motivate. It's what separates coaches in all sports. While many people can explain the mechanics of the game, understanding how to maximize human potential, that's another story. It's an inexact science. And in a game like baseball, where the most inconsequential moment can have the most consequential impact on momentum, Knowing how to motivate your team is essential. And that's where Arizona State head coach Pat Murphy comes in. While coaching styles always vary, Murphy's can sometimes border on the bizarre. We play hard. We have to play hard because we stink. So it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to not play hard if you're not very good. Why don't you just play good from the first inning? You know what I mean? Instead of driving me crazy. I finally almost quit in about the seventh. And I was making, as I showed Eric, I was making the 06 lineup up. You can see right here, it says 06. And I got Zinna in relief, and Martinez, kid we got coming in, Bordas maybe at the end, Perez and Brez maybe in the middle, because that's a fifth and sixth innings important. They don't respect me at all, that's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> We've struggled with that all year. These type of games, uh, Murph usually shuts up about seventh inning. And uh, like he said, you know, that's when, that's when we get going. <laughs> <laughs> Defensively, we're struggling a little bit. Step to the left, step to the right, we're not going to catch it. Yesterday, we were flatline froggy. So, today we're a musical. It's really inspirational. <laughs> <laughs> flatline froggy, think about it. Just think for a minute. Got it? No. Musical. I mean, what is music all about? What else do I say to you guys right before we go on the field? <laughs> All right, that we can say on TV. It's got to kind of flow. You don't force it. It spews from you. It's very creative. See where I'm going with this? He'll do whatever it takes to keep the Sun Devils loose as they prepare for yet another stress-filled elimination game, this time against Nebraska and 20,000 Big Red Faithful. Like a comet burning bright. Everybody's dancing to the jail hell's rock. What am I doing? Spider Murphy on the saxophone and little Joe blowing on the slide trombone. I can't sing. <laughs> sing it, baby. As game time approaches on day five of the College World Series, the Sun Devils take their final cuts. Coach Murphy has other things on his mind. Am I as big as this guy right here? Huh? 
That's big. I didn't realize how fat I was. Fat. I didn't realize I was such a fat bastard. I just saw a picture of myself, and I am really concerned, guys. I'm going down to 205. That's a commitment. OK, boys, let's uh, reconnoiter re, uh, our focus here. Talking about Flatline Froggy. Stay with it, boys. This is, this is uh, something you're very capable of. Don't believe for one second you're not capable. The atmosphere, fun. Enjoy it. Love it. Soak it in. It don't have anything to do with that white ball coming at you. Want it hit to you? Hit it on the fat part? Make a pitch. In any order you want. That's what has to happen, okay? Flatline froggy, the whole game, real. Flatline froggy, the whole game, real. Let's go. Fluids? Get rid of fluids? Is that bodily fluids? What is that? A sellout crowd dressed in red on hand for this one, hoping to see Nebraska add to their school record of 57 wins. Give me last game. Lay on the damn line. Go Both on. teams unaware they're about to take part in an all-time College World Series classic. At practice one day earlier, it appeared Coach Murphy had a funny feeling about this game. Score a couple runs early. Larris lead off the game with a bomb or something. First inning, Jeff Larish leading off. Here's the 3-2. Swing and a deep shot in left field. Going back, Boyer, to the track, to the wall. It's gone. It's the 21st home run of the year. 64 driven in, and the Sun Devils lead on Kroenke, 1-0. Third inning, it's Larish. Uh-oh. Long drive, deep right, girts back. My goodness, he's hit another home run. Sun Devils now with a two-run lead. Not for long, next Nebraska at bat. Bases loaded with a run already in. Ryan Worley at the plate. Lewis side, it down the first base line. He gets it down, and the game is tied. Worley is tagged out, but Worley gets the ball down, and Gertz comes flying home from third on a suicide squeeze. Still in the fourth. Christie line drive, up the middle, off the club of hoof. It goes to the center field. And the Huskers have battled back to lead it three to two. Here's the one two. Strike three call, a fastball down Broadway. Here's the three two. Strike three call on the outside corner. To the seventh we go, tied at three. Foul off first base. Ledbetter will have a play on it. He's under it, but gives way to the second baseman, Worley, who doesn't catch the ball. Well, those are the kind of plays that decide ball games. A second life for Curtis, and uh, boy, if he delivers now, the Huskers will be looking back at that one uh, big time. Curtis gets another chance, and surprise, surprise, the very next pitch. Jensen's pitch. Swung on, grounded up the middle, and into center field for a base hit. Larish scores. Taking third is Travis Buck, and Colin Curtis has delivered again, and now the ball gets away. Buck will score on the relay, and it's 5-3 to three as the Huskers' defense has collapsed here in the seventh inning. The Nebraska bench is stunned. Top of the ninth, the gold big red chant echoing throughout Rosenblatt. National Player of the Year, Alex Gordon up with two on against Sun Devils closer, Pat Bresnahan. The pitch, swing and a ground ball, off of the shortstop, Boyer rounds third, he'll score, Simicardis hangs at second, Gordon delivers. And that set up Andy Gertsch, two on, one out, and Nebraska trails no more. Second, the pitch, swing, deep drive, left field, going back to the wall, Felix, it's gone! Bresnahan is livid, and the Nebraska faithful can tell that victory is near. But Arizona State won't go quietly. First and third, nobody out for Joe Persakina. 3-2 pitch, swung on, and that's a blooper into shallow center field. Bruce comes on, and he makes the catch. Tagging at third, Donham scores the throw back to first. Out at first is Zafera on the double play. 
Sun Devils pull within a run, but instead of one out and a man on first for Jeff Larish, it's two out, nobody on. Seven to six, Huskers. Larish has Homer twice, walked twice. Jensen's first pitch, swung on. There's a drive to center field. Bruce back to the wall, leaps. It's gone. Larish has Homer to tie the game and become only the third player in College World Series history to hit three homers in one game. Take that, Huskers. Woo! This is unbelievable. Two outs, top of the 11. Zachary Zinicola facing Andy Gertz, and he gets him swinging to end the inning. Joey Hoop leading off the bottom half for ASU against Tony Watson, and Hoop lines one into left for a base hit. J.J. Safera steps in with Hoop, the winning run at second and one out. Watson's 1-0 pitch, swung on and this looped into shallow right field. That'll drop for a base hit. Rounding third, Hoop coming to the plate. Here comes the throw, not in time! And the Sun Devils have won it! And they eliminate the Nebraska Cornhuskers and move on in the College World Series. And while the freshman J.J. Safera came through with the game winner, it will be the sophomore Jeff Larish's three home runs that the Nebraska fans will never forget. Right now, baby, survive in advance. Oh. Bring it up. It feels great, man. Unbelievable. No one, no one thought it's we could be right. here. No We're fun. here. Let's go. We're going to win it all. Yeah. We're going to win it all. Listen, listen, listen. Larry comes over. Everybody on their knees in the bottom. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, seriously. Everybody on their knees in the bottom. I mean, this is why college baseball players play. Uh, it's, it's a huge reason why I came back for my senior year, uh, and it's so exciting. What a, what a fun time. Great feeling. You know, um, guys are guys battled, you know, and they never quit. And there's plenty of time to quit and plenty of time to not believe. And uh, when you get down in the ninth with a home crowd of 20-some thousand, you know, all cheering against you, and to come back the way they did is pretty special. We're really elated right now, but we got to get back down to that, you know, flat line. We can be a little froggy, but flat line froggy, you know what I'm saying? And uh, we get to that, and we'll, you know. As Larish leaves the park after the game, celebrating with fans and family, one fan returns his third inning home run ball. All he wants is a picture. Larish, the last man on the team bus after a hard day's work, gets one more round of applause from his Sun Devil teammates. It's a time-honored tradition unique to the game of baseball, passed on from generation to generation. A hobby for many diehard baseball fans, keeping score is a lifelong passion for Rosenblatt official scorer, Lou Spry. I'm Lou Spry. I'm the official scorer for the College World Series and have been in the last 25 years. Official scorers are the custodians of two of the game's most important assets, and that's its statistics and its records. They still haven't scored it yet, but I would assume they're going to hang an air on Gordon. I believe they gave him a hit. My little brother played baseball, and so growing up, I was always the scorekeeper for his teams. So it just kind of is habit. Now that I have a son, I'm back into it. He played this year first time, so it's just kind of all coming back. And I think what the fans interested in is when the uh, the star player comes up in the eighth inning with the tying or winning runs on base, then we'll look down and see what he's done. And I like to look back on the history, right? We just like to see what the, what the other player did. Yeah. I really enjoy it, and uh, I don't know how much longer I can do it. I hope I figure that out and, and resign before they have to throw me out this window. 